So Maggio's travelled all the way from Mozambique to join us tonight. Thank you very much for coming such a long way. Where he's worked in, the cons in conservation for a number of years, both in the private and public sectors. And he's seen firsthand the impact that poaching has had on wildlife in his country. Thank you very much for joining us. So first off, can you just tell us a little bit about how you became involved in conservation in the first place? Thank you. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be back in the UK, and especially in a, in a, in a place like this, the Royal Geographical Society. It's a very, a very nice place. Um, how I started conservation is also, like yourself, uh, influenced when I was a small, and um, mainly my father and my grandfather played a lot in influencing my love for, for nature. So I spent a lot of school holidays on wilderness areas around my town in South Africa as well, and that got me influenced uh, and hooked with nature. I ended up doing my undergraduate studies in Cape Town in South Africa, and that's where I more or less got interested in the relationship between people and nature. Um, I went back to Mozambique, um, where I'm from, and I worked with the private sector in environmental consultancy uh, first, first jobs I, I got. And then I got a job in the government, uh, working more closely with national parks and reserves, which was a fantastic uh, opportunity to work there. And the last job I had was an uh, offer to work with the uh, Niasa National Reserve, in a public-private partnership to manage the, the reserve. It was up to 2012 where I had the opportunity to be in the UK, in Cambridge, to do the field course uh, in conservation leadership. And now, now I'm back in Mozambique working in conservation. And how have you found the situation for elephants in Mozambique since you've been back there? Well, it's not been good even before I left to, to do the, the course here in Cambridge. Poaching, uh, elephant poaching has uh, probably started uh, to be felt more intensely around 2009, 2010. That's when the organized elephant poaching, let's say, uh, really uh, reached Mozambique. And when it reached Mozambique, it found a country with a very long border, very porous border, very easy to come in and out, um, a very weak legal system, especially for issues related with conservation, very weak law enforcement, corruption, and the conservation sector was not given the priority required. Um, so that meant that uh, poaching found very fertile soil for poaching to prosper. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, poaching exploded in numbers. And the areas with high density of elephants, like in the north of Mozambique, uh, areas like Niasa National Reserve, Kirimbash, felt that. Kirimbash National Park is a national park in the north, um, for example, had um, elephant uh, carcasses growing eight times from around 100 elephant carcasses estimated in 2011 to more than 800 in 2013. Eight times increase of in, in poaching. Nyasa was also hit uh, not as severely as Kirimbash, but also intensely uh, uh, felt uh, elephant poaching. So, this is probably the worst we've seen in decades of elephant poaching. You've painted a very depressing sorry, picture, sorry. There, I'm afraid. Sorry. Can you give us some hope? What's being done? How is this situation going to be reversed? Well, there are important steps that have been taken uh, in the last, especially in the last two, two to three years. You know, one important thing that, uh, that uh, has happened is within the government, there has been a change um, and a more uh, assuming more the commitment towards, towards uh, conservation. Just this year, for example, there was a London conference on illegal wildlife trade, uh, and Mozambique was present and it assumed its commitment uh, in implementing a number of actions to bring uh, illegal wildlife trade down and combating poaching. Um, and also within the government, the conservation sector was quite successful in getting other sectors within the government to embrace this. And this is, I think, very important because we've been living a bit more within cocoons. Uh, so coming out of that is, is quite important. And uh, that meant the realization by many other sectors that when we talk about elephant poaching, we're not just talking about um, biodiversity conservation. We're talking also about uh, organized transnational crime. And that brought a different perspective to, the, to, to this issue. And legal system was changed. And, 
elephant poaching, which until the beginning of this year was just seen as a small administrative infraction with very light penalties, now is a crime. So there's a new law approved in June which criminalizes uh, elephant poaching and poaching of other uh, important species. So this is a, an important step that, that's happening within the government. Civil society is also an, quite an important aspect, and that's, there's been a change in that. Uh, there's much more awareness from medias, from organizations, from civil society in general. Uh, just for example, in this month, there was a global march for elephants, and probably London also participated. Well, it's a pleasure to say that Maputo, which is the capital of Mozambique, participated in this event, and thousands of people uh, from not only conservation sector, from uh, sports, from culture, from different sectors came together uh, to show that you know, they're concerned and they want to, to see a change in that. And that is important that you have the backup of civil society and the awareness of this. And a, a third point is related to how these areas are managed. And governance is quite an important aspect of these areas. And uh, public-private partnerships in this regard is quite a, a useful uh, tool that Mozambique has found. Uh, so places like Niasa National Reserve in Mozambique uh, was the first one experimenting this model. And that uh, is designed to try to deliver better management on the ground. So tell me a little bit more about Niasa. How does it work? Uh, well, uh, I used to work for Niasa, so it's very passionate. It's a beautiful area. It's, uh, everyone is invited to, to if you I'm can, please <laughs> visit Niasa. You can obviously talk with uh, Director Mark Rose uh, uh, for all the opportunities there. Uh, it's a fantastic space. It's very, very big. It's 42,000 square kilometers. Just to give a comparison, it's, uh, Princess, it's just slightly bigger than the Netherlands. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so it's, it's, uh, it's, it's no a, competition. <laughs> no, it's no competition. It's, it's, it's a beautiful place. Um, and it, it was created in 1954. But up to 1998, it basically remained as a paper park. Um, it was only then when the government uh, had the opportunity to sit down with the private sector and say, well, okay, we have a very large area. What are we going to do? How are we going to manage this area? And they came out with a public-private partnership to, to develop that area. And through that process, they managed to attract organizations like Fauna and Flora International to help uh, develop such area. They done a management plan, and that management plan pr proposed organizing the reserve into small concessions that are managed in different ways. Um, and that uh, resulted in transforming a park, which was a paper park, into one of the best managed conservation areas in Mozambique. In terms of the results, in terms of wildlife, in terms of tourism, in terms of infrastructures, are remarkable within just 10 years. Um, well, FFI continues to be involved in, in Yasa, now looking a bit more on uh, conservancies that they, they, they're supporting, they're called Chiulesi Conservancy. Uh, which is situated also in a beautiful place, again, very beautiful place. There's a remarkable river there that you have to see called the Lugenda River, and Chiulez is just next to the, Chiu the Lugenda River. So what about the challenges involved in protecting such a large area? Is it breaking it down into these smaller, smaller sort of bite-sized chunks? Yes, uh, this is a very remote area uh, as well. It's worthwhile to say. It's right on the border with Tanzania, very in the north of Mozambique. It's a very large area, um, so it's the logistics and, and, and communications, it, it's very challenging. Just to give you one example, um, if we have the reserve management uh, headquarters uh, receiving a tip that a poacher, poaching incident is happening somewhere in the reserve, and you need to send a team there, it can take five hours to a full day for a rangers to reach that place because of the size of this. And the, you know, obviously, the road, our roads are not uh, the best roads. Uh, so this is, this is really unrealistic. It, it gives time for the poachers to uh, do, uh, shoot the elephant, remove the tasks, have a cup of tea, a snack, and uh, slowly escape without being caught. So this is also where the importance of concessions and breaking up the reserve into smaller units, as you said. Um, it brings delivery of action much faster, much quicker. But also, these concessions, uh, remember, we're talking about almost the Netherlands. Uh, these concessions are still thousands of square kilometers. So the, the investment they still require to deliver good action on the ground is still high. So they still need to get access to planes, to helicopters, to good uh, uh, equipment, infrastructure. And 
personal. And here uh, there's a big debate because it's not just about the numbers of scouts, of game rangers that you put, it's the quality of them. You need to have good training, a good, a good system to, to deliver actions on the ground. So if these measures are holding the line, is this a situation which can be sustained? Yeah, su sustainability <laughs> is, is, is a big challenge. Uh, and uh, it's not only a challenge within the asset, it's a challenge in, within other Mozambican conservation areas. The, the government is providing certain funds, but they're very limited, uh, the capacity to, to fund these conservation areas. Uh, donor funding has been the classic source of funding. It's an important one, but it, it, we cannot just con count on one. So the government has promoted the creation of a trust fund, for example, a conservation trust fund was established recently called the Bio Fund, and that is uh, designed to help funding conservation areas and biodiversity conservation in Mozambique. Um, through my uh, placement in the, in the MPhil course in Cambridge, I had the opportunity to help in the development of this strategy uh, for, the, for the trust fund. So we're all hoping that's going to really uh, succeed. Um, and another important um, way of sustaining these costs are these concessions, are the partnerships that are being established in, in conservation areas. And again here, NIAS is a, is a very good example. Uh, from an area that produced zero returns uh, in 1998, even further, 2000, the early 2000, it, it generated it within just that 10 years with that concession model, enough funds to sustain some of the basic activities. So again, if you have areas like the Chulesi Conservancy that is in a beautiful spot and is uh, with the right management approach, is able to generate funds not only for themselves, but by paying concession fees to the government, they are helping to sustain the greater uh, Nyasa National Reserve. So we've talked very much about the situation with the elephants. Now I know that the situation regarding the rhinos is very different. Can you just outline where we are with that? Uh, well, yeah. There's no more rhinos, uh, unfortunately, in, in Mozambique. Um, they've all been poached out. Black rhinos have been uh, reported already extinct in the late uh, 70s. Uh, and there was a number of efforts to try to bring some rhinos back especially with uh, an initiative in the south with white rhinos, bringing uh, uh, rhinos from Kruger National Park into Mozambique. But all over the last five years, uh, all rhinos have been uh, poached out, sorry. So given the speed that the rhinos have been lost in Mozambique, what are your thoughts for the, the, the future of elephants and rhinos? Well, one first thing is uh, we must not lose hope. Uh, no matter how distressful and depressing the picture is, because, and it is, we, we must always believe that there's something that we can do. Uh, I think that's important. But there is a crisis there. There's lots that we have to do. There's a huge amount of work we need to do on the demand side uh, on this, but there's also a huge amount of initiatives that we need to do in-house within each of these countries. And just in the beginning of this year, uh, a number of conservationists got together to see what uh, could be the strategy to tackle this. And the three top initiatives that came up was much better enforcement on the ground, awareness and uh, education from the high political levels to uh, civil society. And the third very important aspect is about local people, the people who are sharing the space and habitats with this wildlife. We need to find ways of engaging them much better there and sharing and uh, the benefits of living and coexisting with that wildlife much better. And if I can say the last thing is also we, on all these initiatives, we, we must always remember that we need to protect the habitats. That is a fabric that will allow the preservation and recovery of these species. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maggio. It's pretty shocking to hear how quickly these animals are disappearing, but it's really encouraging to hear um, that serious efforts being put into tackling this problem. I hope one day you'll be able to take your children to see rhinos I again in the so. world. And Thank mine you. as well. Thank you. Thank and you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.